Now it's time to look at the system diagram for collaborative document editing. So I'm going to give you a high level overview of the system diagram, how I have designed, and it is always, um, you know, debatable. You can come up with a, a even better approach or better system design for collaborative document editing. And this is what I have come up with. Um, this is not exactly a microservice or it's not a monolithic. It's uh, somewhat like service oriented architecture you can think of. I don't want it to uh, uh, show it in a microservice way because it will just um, clutter the uh, diagram. So I have kept it very high level and simple for the understanding purpose. So now I'll give you an overview um, and then I'll go uh, with each and every component in depth. So on the left side, you can see uh, for the representation purpose, there are three clients connected. So they all interact with the API gateway for any operation to be performed. For that matter, to get the comments, uh, which is commented on the Google Doc for any given line or any given section, or be it if you want to send notification, or if you want to grant permission, if you want to ask for the permission or anything, it always goes through the API gateway. So once um, the API gateway uh, gets the request, it actually does the you know request composition. Um, it actually calls the authentication service to check your request is authenticated or not, and all sort of things. And then here you can see um, there is a different service which just takes care of authentication, authorization, or permissions, and the other other component which just takes care of the comments. And it is directly connected uh, to the NoSQL as we are expecting a lot of comments on the document. And we also want to have a hierarchical view of the comments also. Um, so I'm expecting that data to be a lot. So I'm thinking better to save it in the NoSQL DB. <clears throat> and over here we have email, GCM or notification that itself is uh, think as a service which takes care of all the notification related stuff which uses GCM or APN. Over here, we have app server or services, which provides all the different APIs to land to the main uh, you know, Google Docs page. And uh, if you want to export the document to PDF, HTML, or any uh, different format, if you want, all this, um, or even if you want to upload a new document and convert it to Google Doc, all these things will be handled over here. So we have RDBMS uh, because certain things we need um, to be consistent and we need asset property there, um, like users or even the document ID and the uh, reference to the document and all the different resources. Um, so, so we have <clears throat> RDBMS, we have NoSQL, we have Time Series DB, we have Redis, all used over here. Time Series DB, as I have already mentioned, this is mainly used to store all the different um, historical operations performed by individual user on a particular given document. Okay, now come to the main part, the very important part that is Node.js WebSockets and Operations Queue and Session Server. So for the first time when the user connects or opens the doc, he will actually hit the API gateway and he loads the document. And as soon as if he has the permission, he will get a session established once he go to the edit mode. And then he gets a Node.js WebSocket, Node.js or you know, WebSocket connection, um, which is established from the browser to the server always on. So now he can efficiently keep on sending these small operations as and when he wants. Um, and then receive the updates from other clients from the server immediately as soon as they broadcast it. So this design um, is design thinking. Uh, I'm using operational transformation. So I'm expecting the message size to be very small. So web sockets are best uh, for those kind of operations. Uh, even if Node.js um, handles it well. So all this operations should be ordered in a queue because, um, I mean, if two guys are have sent the same operation on the same line or same character at the same time, 
you still or the service should still uh, prioritize one operation over other. So we need to, it's better to put it in the queue and then keep on ingest as and when the operations from all the clients for that particular document uh, keeps coming in. So we have operational queue, operations queue here where the, all the operations are queued over here and the session server will keep on ingesting those operations and it keeps its own state of the document and that acts as a single source of truth. Um, and also it keeps on saving a copy of history um, or operations history into the time series DB over here so that um, if you want to revert it back to a particular version or if you want to check who edited this particular line or this particular word, we can easily get that information from time series DB or I'm using time series DB, but if you if you want, you can actually use NoSQL or if you want to have a, you know, tree kind of representation or a graph representation of how this part, particular, you know, line changed or document changed, you can actually use graph um, DB as well. And there is a cloud storage if you, want to save the document as it is or if you want to when the user converts the document to pdf or html or any other format if you want to give you a, give them a link to um, get the document obviously once you download it you need to upload it to the cloud storage and that link will be provided to the user uh, via email or somehow uh, for them to download so you can use the cloud storage there uh, to save that um, and export a document. Now let's talk about WebSockets. Most of you guys know why do we need to uh, have WebSockets and other advantages. For the newcomers, I'm going to explain it anyway. Um, so you can actually use HTTP AJAX uh, to send the updates to the server and receive uh, in the response itself. Uh, basically, we need to keep on pulling, um, you know, frequently and then uh, get the information and send the information but that is not very efficient because every time when you make a http call it has to do a you know handshake establish tcp connection do a handshake and then send the information and receive the response and this is time taking uh, and also it is overhead um, so to keep the um, connection lightweight we have to definitely go for websocket um, other than http ajax we can actually use long polling or comment like our implementation, but those are not much efficient. Um, and also, every time we may make HTTP call, the header size and everything will be really high. So when we have uh, web sockets, um, it actually makes connection, uh, establish connection once. And once it does, we can actually uh, send and receive the messages uh, seamlessly um, in real time. This actually helps uh, us to keep on sending the information as and when the user modifies the document. We don't need to keep on pulling periodically. So that's where we are saving the bandwidth and also overhead on the you know, browser also. Here we have a connection open. If the user is editing something, then only we send it. Or if you have any updates to be received, then only we will receive the message. Um, like server only sends the message. We don't need to ask server, do we have any information? When we have a connection open, server will keep on sending the updates to us. So these are the advantages of having you know, web sockets. And on the server side, we can actually use Node.js, which is well-built um, um, you know, asynchronous server, uh, which actually hands lightweight messages and which is um, built for these kind of use cases. And also when we use WebSocket along with Redis, we can actually uh, provide a lot of cool features, like we can actually enable chatting feature for the users who are editing the document that can be easily implemented just with the WebSockets and the Redis. And also we can uh, in real time show where exactly the user is editing their cursor in different colors uh, as and when the user joins to um, collaborate uh, to edit that particular document. This is all possible just because of the WebSocket, um, you know, real time communication. So now um, I'm going to a little bit explain about why I have chosen to use microservice um, kind of architecture um, for this particular application. Because there, if you see, there are different kind of services altogether. There is a notification service, there is a comment service, there is a you know session service, there is an operation service, there are different APIs, right? If you see all of these different services, I can't make all of these service onto a one service and it will look, I don't want to make it a monolithic service. If one uh, service goes down, it just pulls everything along with it. So, I have identified very important services. I can just 
deploy them in a separate as a separate services. It will never impact, you know, failure of one service will never impact. Say, for example, if our comment service goes down, our doc editing, um, you know, saving, export, import, and everything is still functional. Only the comment services will not be available. I mean, that's fine. Instead of taking down the whole app, it's fine to ha have one service down and all the other services are up and running, you know, very well. So that's the reason why I'm going with the microservice architecture. So first of all, it gives you the simplicity and modularity of the different services. We can maintain um, different services um, without affecting other services. And the second thing is it's very um, easy to develop and uh, we can develop any services faster without affecting anyone. And uh, um, if you want to talk uh, from the developer's perspective and management perspective also, Managing, you know, sub, a small service uh, separately itself is much easier than managing the a whole um, monolithic service. And also, uh, if you're a new developer who joined the company just now, and uh, if you give the call for the whole Google Docs, it's very difficult um, to understand if it is a monolithic application. But instead, if it is a um, microservice, you can just give the comment section call. And if you tell them to understand, it's much easier to understand the whole core and you can uh, easily debug anything or you can easily add any services into it. But if it was a monolithic, there is a, a hell lot of dependencies in between different services. We can't just um, separate those things, even if you built it as a module, but it will not be that easy. As a service, it is much easier to understand, develop and maintain and deploy also. And also, uh, you know, freedom of using different um, technology stack. I can um, say, for example, for all the APIs, I can use Python as um, um, you know programming language to develop that, and I can use C plus plus for handling the you know operational transformation itself, because it is proven that C or C plus plus is kind of much faster when you have a lot of operations involved in it. It's fine. I'm I have that freedom to um, you know implement operation transformation using C or C++ and implement uh, all the APIs and all the comment services and everything is in Python or Java. That's one more uh, advantage. If it was monolithic, so you will actually tie it up to the old um, you know, code itself and you have to, even if you add, want to add a new service, you are kind of um, tied or locked down to the old technologies and you have to use the same old thing. But in this case, it's not like that. You can actually use any different stack for any different service and then you can deploy independently and then make them talk to each other using RPC or um, you know, protobufs or you know, REST or anything like that. And uh, also the fourth thing is scaling is easy. You can just scale up the service which is getting have more traffic. Say for example, if the, if the people are not actually using the chat services, it's fine, we can just scale down and then we can save a lot of resource. And uh, we can scale um, comment service only and then we can scale API service separately. Which we have a granular control on the services where we want to scale or we want to downscale. So, it will, so these are the advantages of having you know, microservices. So let's learn about API Gateway. When I say um, the system, uh, the Google Doc system is designed in microservice um, architecture. Obviously, you must be thinking that there are so many services, how the clients will know the, know about all of these services and how do we deploy and everything, right? So for all of those things, uh, the API Gateway is the answer. All of the microservices are usually deployed in Docker-like um, you know, uh, strategy, right? Uh, each and every... Um, microservice is built into a Docker as whenever we want to scale, we actually increase the number of uh, Dockers uh, deployed um, and everything. So this all can actually happen via one system itself, like for example, Kubernetes, for example, or uh, Docker Swarm, or there are so many other uh, technologies available there. So Kubernetes also act as a API, get, API gateway. Uh, what it actually does is, as the name indicates, it is the main entry point for the for all of the backend services. This is the gateway where the clients will actually hit the request to. So, when the client make a request, the request will first land at the API gateway, and then the API gateway decide 
which microservice uh, or which instance of the microservice uh, where to hit that uh, uh, hit the service to get the response back to send it back to the client. So these are the advantages of having the API gateway. So the first one is single entry point. So the clients will never need to know for this service where to contact or which IP to contact or which static IP or which hostname. It's always one entry point, one IP. It's well, um, we, we, it's easy to configure. So there is always a single entry point and API composition. So when you have a microservice, say for example, just to get the uh, product information, uh, this is just for example, just to get a product information uh, in an Amazon page for a product, uh, we might need to hit, uh, you know, product related information, recommendation, I don't know, reviews, ratings, uh, number of uh, items left in the, you know, inventory, all this information, right? So there can be about 10 to 15 API calls we might need to hit if we don't have API gateway, because all of those are different services. We have to obviously call all of the different services to get all of the information. But if you have API gateway, what happens is, we just need to make a couple of calls, one or two calls, just to API gateway. Internally, API gateway, what it does is, when the request lands to the API gateway, it internally does the API composition. What is API composition? Say, if I'm requesting for a product API, it knows internally, based on the configuration, that it should call five to six different services. What are those services are? It automatically and asynchronously and parallelly, which calls five to six different calls, either by HTTP, REST, or, uh, you know, um, RPC, AMQP messaging technology, or any other uh, protocols, just to get, um, to invoke those respective services and get the response. It actually calls the product API, recommendation API, inventory API, you know, reviews API, ratings API, and collect all the information into one response and sends it back. How cool is that? We just made one call and the API gateway took the responsibility of calling all of the different services and collect all the you know, result and send it back. And this is very easier for the client side to get the information of all the different services, right? So that is one. Second one is security. So Developers will be keep on adding services and um, how do we make sure that all of the services, if it doesn't have API gateway, how do we make sure that all of them are properly protected? Are they authenticating not or checking the permissions or not? So if you have an API gateway, we just need to hardwire for all the API here, for all the requests, authentication is must. So kind of these services are kind of safe inside. So these services are kind of hidden inside the network, uh, the API gateway. So no one from the outside can access from the, from the customer or the client perspective, only the APIs which are exposed can be accessed where all of these different microservices are kind of hidden inside. So that way we can actually maintain security easily. In case of Google Docs, the same thing, right? We shouldn't let, um, others to see the comments for the document which he doesn't have access to, or he shouldn't be able to communicate um, or edit the document which he hasn't have access to, right? So all these things can be easily handled in API Gateway. And the third is dynamic service discovery. Service discovery is a different um, and difficult problem when we have a you know, microservice kind of architecture, because when you have number of microservices um, in the backend because of the auto scaling, and downscaling and um, you know different versions of the same service deployed uh, and everything happening, we can't have always static IPs to all of the services. And how does the client knows where are these services deployed, what is that IP or what is the DNS or whatever, or the domain name? So that is kind of difficult, but that is solved easily using API Gateway because the client should only remember the API Gateway's IP or domain name. and. Um, the API gateway automatically will keep on talking to the service registry where it has the registry of what service is in which dynamic IP and everything. So it automatically hits the respective IP and gets the information back and gives back to the client. So that way, service discovery is much easier. And the fourth one is uh, you know, service partitions are hidden. As I mentioned, these 
different microservices are hidden behind the API gateway, and that's one thing. And also, today I might be thinking um, just the comment part, or I'll take a different example in the Amazon you know, product page itself. If I have a ratings and reviews itself as one service today, but tomorrow I might think, okay, I want to split that into two parts. I want to make ratings itself as a separate service and reviews as a separate service. If I didn't have the API gateway, it would have been a tedious process because I have to change the client code also to you know make two different calls, one for rating and one for you know reviews. Because of the API gateway, I don't need to do that at all. So I just need to split that into two different services and then reconfigure the API gateway configuration to call one more you know, API call to get the rating separately and the review separately and call it together. That way, service partitions are also hidden. I, I think I already spoke about hidden microservices, right? So, and the sixth one is very important, circuit breaking. So, this is very important. Um, so, there is one um, one module which is developed by Netflix called uh, Hysterix. You can take a look at that. It is a very good, um, you know, application to handle circuit breaking in, in case of uh, when, if you want to. Um, what does circuit breaking means? Say, for example, I have a API call making, and it in turn making making about five calls, okay? I'll just show you over here. So it's making five different calls. For some reason, my rating API is overloaded. In this case, this product API call will be keep on waiting until this request is served back. I have got request for the response for this, 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 this. I'm just waiting for response for this particular microservice for the rating to receive. This is kind of blocking, right? Because, because of just one uh, microservice is not responding. The, the, the whole thread itself is blocked and in turn, we're not able to send back this much response to the client. So instead we can actually, um, so all these kind of problems, right, can be solved using a circuit breaking pattern. So we can actually set a timeout first on each and every microservices. If when the API gateway makes a call to all of these different microservices, if any of the services didn't respond with a given set, you know, hard timeout, just written all the response, whatever you have so far. And you can set the priority also. Say if you have the product information, just send it back. But if you have all the other information, but not the product information, just discard everything and send 500 or 404 or whatever, 500 or something. So that all composition we can actually easily make. And also one more thing is, when um, the product API understands that the ratings microservice is not actually responding like the way it was supposed to respond, it can actually stop making requests to this service at all. It will just stop making requests because it understands that this guy is kind of overloaded, so it's not responding. If I keep on making the request, it will just keep on cascading the uh, you know requests, and then the service will never recover. So it just stops sending the request to the ratings API. So it lets the ratings API to recover and um, and, and become healthy. So after some time out, like maybe after 10 minutes, it will just make one call to check whether the rating API is up and running healthy, healthy or not. If it gets the response, then it considers that the rating API is up and running, and then it keeps on making the uh, you know ratings microservice call whenever there's a product API call. If it doesn't respond, the ratings API, if it doesn't respond, then it will just think that the, if the service is still down and it will never make a call. So this is what's called as circuit breaking. And this is very essential when you have a microservice architecture. Uh, in case of Google Docs or collaborative editing also, so if the you know operations handling part itself is down, the whole thing is down anyway, but operations, handling part is up, but other things like comments down or, you know, cursor status is down, or maybe the online users is down, it's fine. For us, the document uh, data and operations um, uh, is very important. We can let the let API 
or the API gateway, return the response back and forth and wait for other services to recover. And we are almost uh, in the end of the video. So I'm not actually the right guy to talk about the front end, but here are some of the ideas um, on how we, how we can actually implement Google Docs front end. So you can actually use Angular or any other front end technologies. The trick is you can't actually render actual Google Doc on the browser. So whatever you see, the Google Doc, whenever you edit, it's actually the HTML page itself. So whenever you add a new page, you're actually adding a new div. And then whenever you're adding a new line, you're actually kind of adding a div or span or a paragraph or something like that. So you're actually not editing the doc on the browser at all. So keep that in mind. So it's all the HTML5 or JS implementation only. So this is all HTML itself what we are editing. It doesn't matter you're actually implementing Google Docs or Excel sheet or you know, rich text or just a plain text, it's all HTML. So what are the features we support um, in the front end is only the features which are actually supported in the actual doc because we can't support something fancy on the front end and we can't just, when, when the user wants to download it as a doc or docx, we can't just say that it's not supported, right? So we have to only provide the features which are supported by the doc or docx. And then uh, we had to give the option to user to download um, the whatever, the user has written on the browser to as doc or docx or pdf or html or any other different formats we would like to and we can actually use uh, you know in javascript web workers in the back end to have a you know parallel threaded operations one which keeps um, keeps on uh, taking care of sending the operations and receiving and acknowledging and waiting for server to confirm and everything because if we just, um, as we know that J JavaScript is a single threaded, if we just give all of the task onto one guy, it will be heavily overloaded. So we have to actually use JS web, worker, web workers, one, one thread which kind of handles the, um, you know, operations and transformations and, um, you, know, you know, acknowledgements. And the other, you know, worker which actually handles the, um, the, f the actual features of all the docs which is supported or shown on the HTML. Um, you can actually build using HTML5 canvas, but I don't suggest that it's totally like a crazy thing to do. It's better to use HTML and there are a lot of other uh, open source JS implementation for, um, you know, collaborative editing is available like uh, ShareJS. You can just use those as a front end and then you can build on top of that as well. I think I have uh, explained most of the information related to collaborative editing. Um, if you guys like this video, hit a like button, comment uh, if you guys have any suggestions. And um, thanks as usual. Please like, share, subscribe, and tell your friends about the channel. Thanks a lot.